Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have another fascinating, uh, fascinating guest with me today. Who I have with me is the out-of-body traveler, Graham Nichols. Um, he's a master at out-of-body experiences. Um, Graham Nichols is an English author as well as lecturer. Lecture, excuse me, an advisory board member for the Rhine Research Center. He's a leading practitioner and researcher of OBEs or out of body experiences. By the way, when you hear us refer to OBE, if you hear us say OBE or NDE in this show, that means out of body experience and near death experience. Sometimes I have to clarify that. But a bit more about my guest, Graham first came to public attention as an installation artist exploring psychology and consciousness through specifically designed technological environments, the logic was sort of exhibited at London Science Museum in 2004. These installations also led to immersive technology designed to induce out-of-body experiences and later his infraliminal sound recordings, which helped bring out the vibrational sound state key stage of an OBE in majority of those who use them. Wow, that's amazing. In 2011, he published Avenues of the Human Spirit, a moving account of his personal journey and explanation of the nature of consciousness. His second book, Navigating the out-of-body experience offers a totally new way to learn and approach the subject of OBEs and ex extend the mind. He's also a co-author of Consciousness Beyond the Body, a scientifically per focused exploration of the theories and evidence for out-of-body experience published February 2016. And I want to give him a big warm welcome to the show. Graham, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. Um, I, I love out of body travel. I, I just I, I I've been trying to do it for a long time. I don't think I'm doing something right. I I don't know. Okay, you're I've, I've been using the Robert Monroe Hemi Sync by Neural Beats. They seem to work. Like I I can tell you experiences I've had. Like but but I, I'd love to hear more about like the technology you made to um to induce OBEs because. I, I seem to get close. I get to a point where my body's vibrating. Then I almost get like a sound in my head. It almost sounds like a whooshing sound. And then it seems like before, I, right when I'm about to pop out of body, like I get scared and I back out of it. Is this common? And, and uh, what, what, before we get into the technology you, you made, but is this, is this common for a lot of people that are trying to go out of body? Yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of... Um misconceptions and you know um misinformation really that makes people scared of the experience so you do get you do get a lot of people having fears associated with it and then also you can just have i guess a natural fear because it's something unknown something you haven't done before that you're not familiar with that kind of thing so so yeah it's pretty common to have fears um i addressed that in the early part of my second book i go into ways that you can work with fear for example using self-hypnosis techniques and things like that to try and overcome those fears because they do need to be addressed if you want to progress with this kind of work so so yeah there's quite a few ways of of working with it um, as far as my technology I've looked at all kinds of ways to help induce the experience I'm, I really enjoy the science and looking into the things that we know about the experience and trying to move that forward and work out exactly how the experience is initiated and if we if we know more about that we can use various different tools to help cause the experience so immersive technology for example like you mentioned I made a virtual reality installation at the Science Museum in London so that was an example of using virtual reality to simulate the experience with the intention of hopefully triggering the real experience. I also created um, structures that would lift the person off the ground, so make them feel like they're floating, which also helped to give that suggestion to the unconscious that they wanted to have an out-of-body experience or that they were having one. Um, and then I mixed in NLP and hypnosis and things like that as well as the structure so it created um, an immersive experience and then I've also worked with with sound um, the, the hemi-sync that you mentioned uh, is based on binaural beats I I personally did haven't found binaural beats that effective for me so back in the 90s I started to experiment with using different kinds of sound and different frequencies and different structures to try and 
help with bringing about the experience and that led to that led to me working with infrasound so very very low level frequencies and also subliminals and hypnotic suggestion and things like that uh, bringing it all together to create something that helps get to the vibrational state is what I what I focused on I'm not sure you could really make something that would always initiate an out-of-body experience because it's quite a powerful thing if you not through sound I don't think there would be a way to do that um, where it would work every single time but what you can do is get to the launch pad the vibrational state the point at which you can initiate the experience yourself quite quite consistently so as long as you learn some techniques mixed in with tools like the infraliminal sound then then it can, you can initiate an out-of-body experience yeah I, I was wondering like to, like when we talk about the infra infra liminal sound recording is like how does that differ from a binaural beat like what what and and what helps stimulate more the 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 the, the experience of actually going out of body well binaural beats are are basically using two frequencies with a slight differential usually about four hertz uh, differential between the two frequencies so one frequency goes through one ear the other frequency goes through the other ear and then with it the idea is is that within the brain you get this beat is created because of the differential between the two frequencies like i said i didn't find that particularly helpful for me um so I started to work with, well, what happens if we use different kinds of sound? And I found that low level frequencies like infrasound, which is where the name comes from, infraliminal. Um, so I started to experiment with using frequencies just below the threshold of hearing. So with frequencies that you can hear clearly in a certain rhythmic uh, pattern, and then low level frequencies below that. So it's totally different to binaural beats. It doesn't use this beat idea or, or the I, I, any of the ideas related to binaural beats. So it's actually better as a more immersive experience. So it's better to play it on speakers, for example. You don't need headphones because it's not creating this uh, effect in the brain. It's more creating a kind of riff, rhythm and and, and, a, and and these low level frequencies that cause small changes in in uh, brain waves in that way so it's a it's a different approach completely really now do you agree with like researchers like Robert Bruce like I've read his work or I've at least looked into it you know a lot I, I listen to interviews he's done with Art Bell and he talks about the astral world being like this like whole other world that we're able to go out and experience that like most obviously not most of the population doesn't know about of our world like but um you know he explains like places like astral hospitals um what it, what is going on in the astral world and like what what all can we experience on that on that side well i mean robert bruce is coming at it from an esoteric perspective um i studied the esoteric ideas um and I've I've taken some elements of it to be of value, but many elements of it I think are inconsistent with our modern understandings and with the the latest science. So I think that it's it's interesting in terms of the astral planes because if you go back to the original esoteric writings of people like Lead Beta, um, A. E. Powell, um, Alice Bailey, a lot of the sort of Theosophical people and um, some of the more occult writers of that era, where most of those ideas come from, the sort of late Victorian sort of era, um, you basically find that most of them considered it to be an illusory world. They didn't consider it to be an objective, separate reality, which is sort of, it, it seems to be, have become a concept that's quite common now that people consider it to be somehow objective. But I think that in actual fact, in, in a lot of the original writings, they saw it more like a like a construct, um, a mental construct that had a kind of consensus reality to it. So multiple people could experience the same framework or the same reality, but it was based upon the mental activity of the individuals involved. So it was a 
if you like, a kind of group mind. And, and in many ways, I think that is probably the best way to look at it uh, today. I think what we're getting with ideas like the extended mind and the idea that consciousness is non-local, I think that probably the astral planes or the other levels, the transphysical levels that we that we encounter, I think that they probably are almost like a combination, like a, um, a consensus of different minds all interacting and creating something from that. So, so in, so in a sense, I think they're illusory, but in a sense, I think they have a degree of objectivity because they are consistent across multiple people at times. So it's like a shared, it's almost like a telepathic shared network, if you like. That's, that's how, I, how I tend to look at it. So I have a different perspective to Robert Bruce, um, but I, I'm very interested in the science. So I want to know what's really going on. So I like to test all these ideas and see what, see what comes out of it. Do, is there such a thing as a silver cord? Is there such a thing as an astral body? Is there such a thing as astral planes? All these kinds of things. I like to explore them and, and question them and test them and see if we can actually gain greater understanding of, of the nature of these realities by doing that. Yeah, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that people have nowadays is a lot of people, I, I think I heard you talk about this, this is why I wanted to bring it up. I think a lot of people are getting lucid dreaming and out of body experiences um, mixed up, like they're totally mm. separate experiences, correct? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because because people are th where, where I'm going with that is I think a lot of people are thinking that they can lay down and go to sleep and they're having a lucid dream and therefore they've achieved the astral realm. That's not the case. An out of body experience and, and maybe you can verify this. I'm I'm not sure if I'm right or not. I'm I, so I wanted your expertise. Like an out of body experience is a complete separate experience. It's a it's when your body actually pops out of it and you're experiencing another realm. Is that is that and that's and a lucid dream is more like where in your you're in the dream state and you're interacting in that world is that correct or no yeah yeah i mean you're not necessarily in another realm you can be in the physical reality in in the outer body experience um i have experiences on both um levels that seem to be other levels of reality i say seem to because you know they could be more of this kind of construct like i was just mentioning um but but we can definitely experience all kinds of different environments within within the OBE. But the, the the key thing with an out of body experience is that they they happen in all states of consciousness that we're aware of. So they and even in cardiac arrest. So even in you have the near death experience category as well. So we have all different states of mental activity right through to no mental activity. Um, and, and you get out of body experiences in all of them. Whereas lucid dreams and the criteria of lucid dreaming only happens within sleep and only happens within this state of where you become consciously aware that you're dreaming. So it's a, it's a, it's a very specific thing, lucid dreaming, and it can be a launch pad for an out of body experience. But the thing to remember is so can many other things, you know, you can, you can launch an out of body experience from a, from a, relaxed waking state which is actually the most common way that it that it happens according to the research so i think what's happened is there's been certain organizations or individuals writers etc and the internet has popularized this idea that lucid dreaming and astral projection or obes are basically the same thing but i think when we actually get into the details of the experience and if we're very precise and careful in how we define things and how we look at things, then I think it becomes clear that they're, they're not the same experience and, and they have very distinctive differences. I have a blog post on my website that goes into the different uh, differences between them. Um, but it is one of those things where if you say, well, um, there's a difference between waking reality and dreaming, um, we all kind of know that's true and we all experience the world when we're awake differently to how we experience it when we're dreaming but if you wanted to actually explain to someone what is the difference you know because you might experience walking around talking to people um, like you mentioned going to a hospital or whatever you might you might experience all of those things in a dream 
and you experience those things in waking reality. So what's the difference? It becomes very tricky if you're talking just about the surface level of things. Um, so I think where you really start to find the difference is when we look at what's going on in the brains of people who have out-of-body experiences, for example. So there's been studies like in Canada, there was a study where they put a, a girl who could have out-of-body experiences consistently, they put her into an F fMRI scanner and they looked at the brain activity that she had while she was having the out-of-body experience. And they found an array of different activity, but none of it was consistent with dreaming. And that kind of research has also been done with EEG, showing that the activity in the brain during an out-of-body experience is very different to the activity during a, a dreaming state. So that's one good example of why they're different, even in a physiological sense. Now, what about, I know you've worked with the Rhine, you work with the Rhine Research Center, you worked at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, in your studies, like, what, what have you, have you looked into, like, the, uh, the effects of, like, out-of-body experiences in, like, the psychedelic realm, for example, like, the psychedelic realm fascinates me, I'm not, like, I don't do it a, a lot, you know, but, like, just the idea that, the, that people are having this shared experience where, you know, they'll hallucinate and they're, they're experiencing another realm. Like, it seems like, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between that and the, and the outer, other body experience. And then that makes you think of, well, what really is our reality? Are we in some kind of holographic reality? You know, like, what are your thoughts on like, and, and people can, I guess an out of body experience can be triggered off of a psychedelic experience, but what do you think about all that? Um, I made the decision quite early on that I wouldn't go down the psychedelic route. Um, I wanted to, I, I guess, not complicate my own uh, brain chemistry by using external chemicals. So I don't even drink alcohol. Um, so I, I'm, I'm quite, from the beginning, I kind of focused on not going that route. But that's not to say that I have anything against it or that I haven't researched it. I have looked into it and looked at some of the experiences. There are there are some crossovers in some uh, with some substances like dimethyltryptamine, for example. Some people feel there's a strong relationship between some of the experiences people have with near death experiences and DMT. Um, Henbane has been associated with out-of-body experiences. Fly Garrick has been associated with out-of-body experiences. So there are certain substances that do seem to have some crossover, but they also seem to have distinct differences again. So whether it's um, whether it's a, a useful tool in terms of specifically for out-of-body experiences, it can be a useful tool in other ways obviously, but I think when when talking specifically about our body experiences, I think that there's always this blending or this crossover between the psychedelic and the and the experience of the out body experience. So you don't get the the kind of pure experience somehow. You get kind of a mixture of of different elements, which is also can happen with dreaming as well, that you get a kind of mixture between the dreaming and the out body experience, which that that can be problematic because if we want to focus on the more objective objective experience it can be better to to go more of a conscious route so you don't have that sort of blurring between the two things so it can it can be a tool um ketamine is another another example of a uh, that people have out of body like experiences so so there are a few different things that do cause something similar but they're they're not exactly the same. So that that's the, I guess that's the, the bottom line with it. Yeah, that's awesome. But like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what reality are, are the different realities that people are experiencing? And I guess that, that thing, so, I mean, like, do you think they're all separate realities? Like there's the out of, out of body world, the psychedelic world, the dream world. I mean, and I guess the out of body world would be considered the NDE world. It seems like a separate reality, but like, do you think these are all different realities that we can experience? in this complicated life it is that we call consciousness and whatever our reality is? I think that they're probably interconnected um, states. I, I, tend to, I tend to start from the, from the 
premise of of consciousness as being the the main thing so i tend to see these different different realities if you like as being extensions of consciousness so i i tend to feel that what we're dealing with is is an extended mind and and if you if you start to think about the idea that our consciousness is maybe not contained within our brains and that consciousness is maybe connected to a bigger system i see it almost like a bit like a computer connected to the internet um, you have the individual computer which would be your brain and then you have the internet which would be the the network the psychic system if you like and there's millions of computers all connected to this same system and that's what builds up what we understand to be the internet i think it's something like that with consciousness that we're all interconnected um, across a kind of field of, of information and and from that you get these different consciousness structures or these different um frameworks that that seems to be a, a working hypothesis i i would say i don't i i'm still open to new evidence and to finding out exactly what's going on i i think that there are certain understandings that suggest what might be going on but i don't think we have the whole picture yet so we're it's just conjecture at this point but i i think that something along those lines is probably what's going on based upon what people experience what they consistently see all of this kind of stuff it it seems to be part illusory so part construct part psychology of the individual and part something else part something that is objective and that's coming in from some other source so I mean, when we start to get into, are we living in a hologram and are we living in a, in a kind of um, simulation, that kind of thing, I, I don't feel I'm qualified to really get into that. I think, uh, I think the scientists will probably get closer to understanding that kind of thing. But I don't hugely lean towards that idea, to be honest. I think I tend to, I tend to think, think that we do live in a, in a real reality, but but it's a, it's a reality that's more mysterious and wonderful than many people think, maybe. <laughs> I agree. Um, and now, what I was going to ask you is uh, what kind of techniques you use to go out of body. Now, the one that I was real familiar with was where you, uh, I'll just demonstrate for the audience, where you imagine a rope up above you and you just pretend like you're, you're pulling yourself from this rope and you're separating your body from you know, coming outside of itself, like, um, and then I've heard other techniques too. Do you use those or do you have anything similar to those or what do you? I, I think what I would say about that is the biggest mistake people make is focusing on techniques. Okay. I, I, I think that the reason so many people struggle with getting to out of body experiences is because it's, it, it's almost like people collect techniques and there's there's many of them and yeah you have to use some kind of technique in some sense but the real key if people want to know the real key to doing this it's getting into the right physiological mental body state from the beginning if you're in the right state then a very very simple technique um, any any technique you like will be effective but if you're in the wrong state if you're just in normal and a waking consciousness say you've been at work all day or you know watching tv or whatever it might be then the to climb that mountain to get to the out of body experience is very very difficult because you've already you haven't given yourself a launch pad you haven't given yourself the foundation or level um, from which to get to the out of body experience so i think don't focus so much on the on the uh, techniques focus more on changing your physiological state um, to make it more conducive for the experience to happen. Now, do you, does that go along with like, kind of like, do you agree with like what, what the new age people say, where you, they say like, if you raise your frequency and vibration by meditating, then you can, um, uh, that you can attain an out of body experience. And that kind of makes sense in a way, because it seems like, Oh, I've heard, I mean, like, it seems like the body vibrates before it pops out of body. Um, and I don't know if that's completely correct. That's what I've experienced, but like, do, do we need to be at a higher vibrational rate, like to, to achieve this? 
no we just need we just need to change out of our ordinary state of consciousness the 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 physical body um our normal body schema our normal sense of self is dominant most of the time we have this dominant sense of this is me i'm in this body i'm sitting in this room this is me doing my day-to-day -day activities this is sort of the the belief system the schema the structure that we interact with the world via um, we have to break that down um, or even lose that altogether in order for the outward experience to happen so all the techniques all the methodologies all these ideas about raising frequency and whatever they're all basically trying to shift us out of that sense of this is me and this is all i am um, once once you get you get beyond that that's when the experience can start to unfold so so that's why i say the the techniques in many ways are they're like a they're like going down the wrong road in many ways um when it, you know these kind of things like the rope technique and whatever i mean someone will do it a thousand times and get nowhere and someone else will do it once and be successful and the difference is that one person was already in the right state at the beginning so that's why it was successful and the other person will will not be in the right state and that's why they're unsuccessful um but if they're both still just focusing on techniques or other people are focusing on techniques, they're going to be very confused why person A had an out-of-body experience first time and person B has tried a thousand times and got nowhere. But it's because it's not about what technique you use. It's about getting all those elements, those foundational elements in place. What do you believe causes someone to pop out a body that's experiencing a near-death experience? Like, do you think it could be pain? Do you think it could be, I mean, a number of factors? Yeah, it's probably a number of factors. I mean, pain um, has been, I mean, it has been even used for inducing experiences, especially in tribal and shamanic cultures. There's been the use of pain as a way to, initiate experiences, the use of dance, the use of exhaustion, the use of sound in terms of drumming and rhythm, um, all kinds of things like that have been used right throughout time. So those things um, are still valid ways to do it, but there are, there are a combination of factors. I think not everybody has an out-of-body experience when they have a cardiac arrest. So there must be specific factors involved, uh, but we don't know exactly what, but there's something, oxygen depletion seems to be an element of it. Um, but but that's not the whole story either, because again, not everybody who's apoxic or hypoxic um, experiences an out-of-body experience. So yeah, we don't we don't know exactly, but but definitely there's a there's a mixture of factors going on for sure. And that that will trigger the experience. Yeah, I was going to say, would, would, uh, would fasting, as far as like, if somebody was going, doing the, like a fast, like, would that, like, this is like going towards an OBE now, like if somebody wanted to have an OBE, would they, would fasting possibly trigger it? Or, or is that somebody that people ever use that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, like I mentioned, you know, there's, there's all these kinds of uh, things have been used for thousands of years and fasting is definitely one of them. Actually, I recently... I, I've I've done research into diet and nutrition and its its impact on on psychic abilities and out of body experiences, and found that a whole food plant based diet is the is the most effective for for improving psychic ability and uh, experience. And to do some research into. Up. He throws a different question. Um, okay, so well, let's see where we left off. Um, well, we were talking about fasting, and, and I think you explained that pretty well. But what I wanted to ask you was you participated. Oh, you, uh, what, one thing I picked up that you said that I thought was interesting is you said the plant based diet is really good for um, psychic abilities. Um, first of all, are you high, very highly psychic yourself? And um, what made you come to this conclusion? That's really interesting. Um, well, 
I've yes, I, I mean, I've done a lot of work. I mean, obviously, OBEs are. It's interesting how people don't consider OBEs to be part of like psychic phenomena, but I mean, to me, they are. Um, but yeah, I work with lots of different areas, and I've done. I've done laboratory research as a subject. So I've done telepathy research, precognition research, micro PK research, and also remote remote perception. So seeing things at a distance, including with OBs or remote viewing. So yeah, I've done a lot of um, psychical research um, with, with Rupert Sheldrake, Dean Radin, um, Ryan Research Center, et cetera. So, so yeah, and I, I've noticed that when I when I became fully whole food plant based, um, I found that I improved in a lot of my tests and a lot of the research I was doing. My abilities increased, and then I've spoken to a lot of other people over the years, and and they have reported similar things. So then, what I was going to get to before we cut out was, um, I I inspired one of my students to do a PhD where he's researching whether there is any truth to a whole food plant-based diet or a vegan diet and fasting having an impact on psychic abilities. And what he's found so far in his research is that it does scientifically by observing lots and lots of different people. He's shown that people who follow a vegan or plant-based diet experiences, etc., is associated experiences. So the historical impact for psychic experiences or for spiritual by the science so I think that's really interesting. There's no one really done that laugh. It's quite amazing to me that no one's done that research before. Uh, um, I, I think I find it very fascinating. Institute of Noetic Sciences in a study. Can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I was invited to do uh, a talk there. So I, I did a talk about my work and then I took part in Dean Radin's micro PK experiment, which essentially he has a, he has a steel faraday cage essentially but it's like a it looks a bit like a bank vault it's like a steel box with a with a big latch on it that they kind of put you inside so it cuts off all kinds of uh frequencies and it's also sound shielded etc so you go in there and then there was an, an interferometer which is for firing photons so basically there was a, a light on top of this uh, setup and you were put into a chair and then you had headphones on and basically it, it would tell you to try to psychically influence the interferometer, so the photon. So try to basically affect reality on a quantum level using only psychic ability. So I took part in that and got results that suggest that you can actually do this and the overall results with the whole studies and I think he's replicated it about six times now um, in all of that research has been has shown that you can psychically influence things on on a quantum level so that's really amazing research I think and really really shows that the nature of our reality is not what it seems yeah, it's 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 amazing. It's 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 really fascinating. This stuff, I love I love psi and out of body research. It, it really fascinates me. Like I love it all. Like remote viewing, PK. It just it it fascinates me. Like what we can do with our mind and whatever consciousness is. Um, one thing you mentioned was quantum. Um, what is quantum non locality? Well, I'm not I'm not a physicist, but but essentially what it comes down to is uh, you can take a photon, for example, a particle of light. And if you if you take two photons, two particles of light that have been involved uh, in proximity with each other and then you put them at huge distances apart, they will still act as if they're linked. And this this seems completely impossible because we have the idea that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, for example. But when you separate these photons, they they are basically still one, one thing. They operate as if they are one. So across any distance, in, they will instantaneously react in the same way. So if you make one photon spin clockwise, for example, the other photon 100 miles away or 200 miles away or whatever it might be, will react in exactly the same way instantaneously. So it, it, it's, again, it challenges our conception of, 
of reality travel or how can how can distance be traversed in that instantaneous way but it's it's essentially that when you get to that kind of level distance time all of those things don't operate in the same way so it it really challenges the whole structure of reality really that's awesome um now can you talk about what a uh, a peak out of body experience is well, I tend to I tend to divide them up a little bit because not every out of body experience is the same, and not every out of body experience is of the same quality. So I tend to I tend to refer to peak experiences as the ones that have a really high degree of depth, a really high degree of visual perception. Basically, all of the senses, all of the interaction, the whole experience is at it's at the peak level. I also call it an independent consciousness experience. So it's like an alternative term for an out-of-body experience. But that term, independent consciousness experience, refers specifically to what I would call veridical or objective out-of-body experiences, the ones that really are able to do things that seem beyond beyond uh, what's possible by conventional science. So I think they're the most interesting types of experiences. They They seem to challenge our ability to perceive beyond time and space and all of these kinds of things it seems to show that that is possible that's 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 fascinating and then um, one of my last questions for you is you've also done research with the ryan institute can you talk about what you're doing there sure well i i've been involved with the ryan for a few years uh and i i do educational work there i'm on the advisory board and i've also taken part in in experiments the the most significant of those would be a 14 week study so we did 14 different experiments over that over that period so one one experiment a week where i would try to perceive something uh, a target that was set up by the rhine so i was i was uh, living in estonia at the time and the experiment was set up in the US. So, so you know, I wasn't even in the same country. And they were they they would select a, an image, uh, a target in the form of an image, and they would tell me that there's there's uh, they would send me an email to tell me to to try to perceive what what the target was, and I would do drawings, make notes. Um, I used remote viewing techniques, I used out-of-body experience techniques, I used Gansfeld, I used a range of different approaches. I, because we had a long period of time over that sort of 14 weeks, I could try different approaches and see what was most effective. And it was interesting that the ones that were 100% were the ones that when I used the, when I was able to do it via the out-of-body experience. Like I said, again, it needs that peak experience. So I couldn't do that in every single instance, but in, in the ones where it was where I was able to get to that peak out of body experience, then the results were really amazing. So wow. And then you've also done um remote viewing experiments as well or remote perceptions. Yeah, I mean we, we did some uh, during that during that 14 week uh experiment and i also do remote viewing as well i mean i've spoken at the international remote viewing association conference um and i've spoken about my work looking at remote viewing and, and also looking at the crossovers between out-of-body experiences or the types of non-local perception because i tend to think it's on a continuum i tend to think that we're dealing with at one end of the spectrum we have remote viewing which starts off with say more feeling responses people tend to think of it as uh, visual but in the early stages of remote viewing when you're often using an ideogram for example which is just like a little squiggle that you do on a piece of paper and then you put your pen onto the squiggle it's because your the squiggle is essentially meant to represent the the target location so you just do a quick unconscious response in a physical mo movement to the target location and that response gives us the first little bit of insight into what the target location might be so for example if it's a sort of upturned v it might suggest that it's a mountain for example 
So you put your you put your pen onto it, and the first thing instantaneously, the first thing that you that you get, the first reaction that you get unconsciously or in your mind, the first thing that you get as soon as you put the pen on, onto that ideogram is whether it's solid or whether it's you know a watery area or dry or that kind of thing so you get instant feedback in that way and that's how you start to build up the picture so initially i would say remote viewing isn't really using visuals it's more using a feeling or a or just a, like a connection that you might have with it and then it builds up into into the visual so it's a it's a multi-sensory sort of process that you build up so really remote viewing is a protocol it's a it's a structure for for building up psychic information and by using the protocol we get a more accurate uh, picture because the problem is if you just try and use clairvoyance for example that trying to see something at a distance if you just do that cold without building the process up in that way what has been found over years and years and years is that when you do that often there'll be analytical overlay or the mind will get in the way as Russell Targ calls it the mental noise you 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 get this sort of interference of your own mind interfering with the process of remote viewing so that's why it's important to do this whole pro protocol that builds up the information with an out of body experience it's like you're moving along that continuum and you're getting to that point where all of that sensory information is active automatically and you're in a fully immersive experience. So that immersive experience doesn't necessarily always happen straight away and doesn't, sometimes you get the activation of only two colors. This is common in my out of body experiences. So I'll be able to see with duo tone, so only two colors. And in other instances, it will be more multicolored or it will be like even more vivid than physical vision so things things change it depends on the the depth of the experience and going back to what you said about the peak experiences that's the peak experiences are the ones when everything is just in sync and everything is super uh, accurate and pristine although it doesn't always mean that all of the colors are active because i found that some of my most accurate psi perceptions in an out-of-body experience come from the duotone states so the two color states like the cerulean state which is the blue gray perception that i get sometimes so my soho precognitive experience happened when i was in this cerulean state and then also there's another one which i call the crystalline state which tends to be sort of like daylight and natural sort of greens and yellows type type colors but it's very shimmery and sort of crystalline like like that like summer sunlight uh, reflecting on water that kind of uh visual impression so those two are the main ones that i get very accurate perceptions in have you ever had a uh, remote viewing experience where you triggered an out-of-body experience and you kind of projected to your target I don't think I have. No, I can't think of an example of that because usually with remote viewing, I'm very conscious and I'm sitting at a table and I'm, you know, doing uh, doing the process. I, I might be wrong. Maybe there has been an instance, but I, there's not one coming to my mind right now. Uh, that's, that's interesting. And then the last question I have for you is if you can tell the audience about your books, like um, just like a brief. Um, so if they're interested, like, you know, um, well, my first book is called Avenues of the Human Spirit, and that's really my my personal journey, my a lot about my experiences, a lot about the philosophies and spiritual understandings that have come from the experiences, insights really. So a lot of that is in is in that book. And then obviously a lot of people wanted to know how to how to do it for themselves. So Navigating the Out-of-Body Experience is my practical book. It's, it's like a manual with all the, all the frameworks and ideas of, of how to do it. There's currently going to be a new edition of that coming out in the next couple of months because uh, it's like a 10th anniversary version. It was supposed to come out 
earlier, but because of COVID, it's been delayed. So, but it should be out at some point this year. And the the older version is still available with my course. I have a, an online video course that goes into all of the different techniques and all the all the science and all of the methodologies and how to get into the right pre-state and the best foundational level for inducing the experience and it and also comes with my infraliminal technology as well so so you can get the whole package basically so that's all on my website which is awesome. grahamnichols.com that's awesome and that's two l's if you guys wonder yeah. it's graham g-r-a-h-a-m n-i-c-h-o-l-l-s right yeah yeah well thank you honestly graham this was awesome i love talking to people like yourself because this world is such a mystery and it's so fascinating and I love everything that you do. I mean, it really like, it really fascinates me and uh, I love learning. So this was really a treat and, and thank you so much. I'll send you a link when I post it. You're very welcome. It was fun. Thank you. Have a nice day.